Hello, welcome to the show, everyone. It's nice to be back. Um, today, I've got um, my guest is a writer. He's written um, for television and radio and theatre. And uh, um, of course, because we're, our, th our theme mainly is about Doctor Who, this man has written two doc TV Doctor Whos um, for Sylvester McCoy, one being Paradise Towers and the other, The Greatest Show in the Galaxy, and also written for audio as well. Um, so um, we'll we'll be touching upon that and other things that he's done. Um, so please welcome uh, my guest, Stephen Wyatt. How are you, Stephen? I'm fine. Thank you very much. Love it. Thank you very much for being here. I really appreciate it. No problem. Um, Stephen, first of all, um, your early life, where, where did you grow up and what was life like uh, um, as a ch child growing up? Well, I was, I'm a very much a middle class suburban boy. I was born in Beckenham, but I was brought up in Ealing in West London. And I went to a direct grant school uh, in Hammersmith. And then I went to university and I did a PhD after that. So I had quite an academic background and I'd always imagined that I would become an academic. Well, I did become an academic for a very short period of time and I was not happy. I didn't like, I liked the teaching, but I hated the administration and the meeting. Right. <laughs> so I, I left and uh, have basically worked as a, a freelance writer ever since. So that's the background. Yeah. So were you, I mean, when you were young, um, were you um, at school? I mean, were you um, very imaginative with writing? Could, could I, you, I wrote could a you lot. Did you see something there even at an early age? You know? I was always writing bits and pieces yeah. and stuff. Um, and my school was very drama orientated. So we did a lot of, um, uh, a lot of acting. I mean, there is a picture somewhere of a production we did a play called Night of the Burning Castle. And there I am in drag, standing next to Alan <laughs> Rickman, who was the year ahead of me. Um, <laughs> so it was a very drama orientated school. Um, so, but then I sort of when I started doing A level literature, I my own creativity sort of dried up, and it took quite a long time for me to get it back to get back get it back. Really, oh. I became very much more self conscious. And then I started doing sketches when I was at university and stuff and gradually went back into it again. But I, yeah. it took me a long time to say, OK, this is what I'm going to do as a way of making a living, which is a, a very different proposition from doing it, you know, I, I hesitate to say it's a hobby, but doing it as something which is not your main way of earning money. Sure. So when when was it that you first got commissioned to do to do a script professionally? Um, well, what I started off after I left the university, what I actually did for a year, I worked uh, as the writer researcher with the theatre and education team in the Belgrade Theatre Coventry. So that was my introduction. I mean, that was actually a, a salary post and I stayed there for about a year or so. And... Uh, I think the last time, you know, I signed up for any sort of benefit or sort of anything and just said, I'm a, I'm going to earn my money this way was 1977. So yeah. quite a long time ago now. Yes, yeah, a long time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And what was that for, um, Stephen? What, what uh, production was that? Well, the first thing I got, well, it, 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 it's a sort of period I... I think the f the one that made me say that is I got a commission from the uh, oh, the Unicorn Theatre to write a children's play. Yeah, uh, quite a lot of my stuff, early stuff, was children's work, and you know I was still doing bits and pieces of other things to keep going. But from that point on, I just decided I was going to be you know independent and if I had to do other things to make some money I did but by and large the focus was the writing yeah um so the, the I'm interested in the process of writing a script do, do, when when you get an idea or or, or you're looking at something a, a, a production that, that 
is giving a brief about an idea and you're going, oh, how do I, right, would I like to do this one, you know, or whatever it might be. Uh, um, I've tried to write scripts um, just, for, just, for, just for pleasure, really, you know, like short film type ideas, you know, that kind of thing. And for the life of me, I find it very difficult um, structure wise, scripting structure, you know, how to write things and um, descriptive things and all that, you know. Did you train to, did you train to learn that or did it sort of come? I think you sort, of, uh, you sort of absorb it. I mean, you know, I obviously at university, I read a lot of plays and did a lot of theatre and that teaches you something. I mean, I'm not an actor. I never wanted to be an actor, but, you know, at school and university, for example, I played, you know, quite a lot of roles. And I think that means that by and large, the dialogue I write is playable. It can be spoken. It may be slightly, so people may have problems with certain lines or certain ideas, or I don't mean it's all brilliantly written, but the fact is an actor can look at it and say, yes, I can say this. So that's something I learned. Um, it's odd, this thing about form, um, because I do think I've internalized a lot of it. You know, uh, I mean, with radio, a lot of people have a problem, for example, thinking about how to write in radio, and they don't, they get, they somehow find it quite difficult to remember, you've only got voices and sounds. Yes, yeah. Uh, uh, and somehow, because I, you know, I grew up in the age of radio, and in my early life, as a kid, I was basically listening to the radio, not watching television. You know, I was, you know, I, like most people, I think we got a, uh, a television set for the coronation, you know, and I was eight at that point. Um, no, I wasn't, I was five. Um, but uh, I was, so in a way you absorb it rather than analysing it. Um, and I, I am quite lucky because I do, the, the pieces I write tend to turn out to be the, the length they're supposed to be. And I don't know, I can't tell you why that is, <laughs> but they do, I, they, you internalise the structure. You know? So is it, it's just, is it just the fact that you're very precise in your script, how you, you know, your descriptions in uh, your dialogue and your directions, as it were, you know, so-and-so standing there, this is, it's morning, uh, this, that and the other. Uh, is that is that why it, it, it's um, not cut so much? Is it because you're very tight with oh. the script? With the descriptive I, stuff. I yeah. think so. I think also because um, uh, you can actually overplan. And in a way, you've got, you sort of have to go with the material where the material takes you. Um, yeah. And that is a good process rather than a bad process, you know. And I wrote a book about radio drama, and one of my uh, mantras is, which I do, is get to the end once as quickly as you can. Now, that's not always easy and you get stuck, but the point I'm trying to make is until you've got an overall view of what you're trying to achieve and what its boundaries are, you can't usefully move on. If you spend time fiddling around with something in the middle, it does. It's it's almost a waste of time. You once you've got the whole thing, you 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 can start making it better. But until you've made it, finished the whole thing, you can't. I mean, it sounds very banal, but it is like that. I mean, I suppose the, the most extreme example uh, you know I've had of working toward it was Paradise Towers. Um, uh, you know, I've now checked with John Nathan Turner Diaries because I said, did I really make this up? But no, I wrote the first episode in a week um, to a synopsis. And then the other three episodes were uh, commissioned and there was no time for synopsis. This is almost unheard of now. And I wrote the episodes two, three and four, first draft in six days. Uh, which was insane. I, I wouldn't recommend it. Uh, but that was the deal. You know, that was the time I had. 
And of course it became, it was revised, but fundamentally I was doing the work uh, and there were good and bad sides to that. I mean, the bad side is obviously, you know, there, there, there may be some loose ends and stuff that you haven't really followed through and things with, a, some things could have been made better if you, the good side is you have no time to worry. <laughs> You've just got to keep on going, you know, and that sometimes general having that sort of well, it's, I know it's freedom. That sort of deadline, you know, you, you have your you you have to follow your instincts. You've got nothing else to go on, nothing else to go on. You know, I mean, I had a great script editor Andrew who would you know hugely supportive and inventive and contributed a lot. But on those six days, I was basically on my own. Wow, that's quite something. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wouldn't recommend very it. Very nerve-wracking, yeah. It was very, you know, and I, I still think, God, how did I do it? But I, I did. And it's, um, I, I looked in the production diaries, this, this book that, that somebody did, and, and I checked the dates, and this is absolutely true. Uh, it's not something I, I've dreamed as a fantasy. It's yeah. actually actually what happened yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, and that brings us neatly on to paradise towers for first uh, <laughs> interesting because yes. that was going to be my next question so that was a good nice little follow through there um the first story you you you, you wrote yes. for doctor who uh for sylvester mccoy uh, as yes. the doctor um what struck me straight away about it really when i was watching it uh, uh more recently really because i had more time to absorb it with a bit of distance you know i haven't watched it for a while and uh, uh um looking back on it now was much more in d enjoyable to me than make because i missed references i think certain things that were going on in that story i didn't i think may have gone over my head before now uh, it, uh, with, with the benefit of hindsight looking back on it it's quite clever what's going on you know and um and I just wondered, um, when you wrote this, it, it, there's, there's things that remind me of something. And of course, I may be completely wrong, um, but um, it, it's, 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 it's very dystopian, the feel of it is very dystopian. Uh, um, and I just wondered, were you, were you inspired by um, J.G. Ballard at all, the writer? Well, uh, uh, this is a bit of a uh, red herring, I have to be honest, <laughs> because uh, it's known that... When I went in to see Andrew and I said, look, I'm not really a science fiction person. Um, and he said, but I do like J.G. Ballard. And I said, there's this book I've been reading called High Rise, which is about a power struggle in a, in a tower block. And he said, well, I have no objection to uh, a story about a planet, which is a tower block. And that is as far as J.G. Ballard went. At that I discovered Andrew is still to read High Rise and I never went back to it, but if you read a lot of fan commentaries, you would believe that it is an adaptation of High Rise. Or, uh, and actually, the basic inspiration is much more fundamental than that. Um, I lived off the Walworth Road in South London for 35 years, and I was near it, near one of the largest housing estates in Europe. And there were ones down at Elephant, there was one, there were at least three of his large estates. So that was rather than literary influence, he was actually seeing the stuff. Uh, and also, um, I went to visit a friend in the East End, and there were these lifts, and they were little tin boxes that went up and down. One did the even floors, one did the uneven floors. Uh, there were no floor indicators inside the lift. Um, and what the kids used to do was they'd get in, press four or five buttons and go out. So I was going up and down, up and down in this tin box. And every now and then the door was open. There was nothing to say what floor I was on. Uh, I mean, it was a complete nightmare. So that's why there were a lot of lifts in Paradise Towers. So I, I would say that the basis of that story, it was much more inspired by that and by the idea of architects not really understanding creating spaces for people. Um, that was much more the inspiration than J.G. Ballard, really. 
that was the sort of uh, the inspiration I was drawing on. It's it's really interesting looking back on it, and, and there's so many characters there as well. You're very good at writing lots of characters, but also giving them, you know, a life. You know, a, a, within that, it's interesting. You did that with Great Show as well. We will get onto that in a minute, but I still want to t talk about yeah, Paradise. I think, I, I think yeah. that's partly also uh, a theatre training. I mean, I think I write longer scenes than a lot of people do as well for that reason. Um, yeah. But I, you know, I, yes, my training was in theatre rather than in television, and that may may make a difference to it. Um, yeah. to have. I mean, as you know, it was very interesting because the story was extraordinarily badly received by the fans. The oh. fans hated it, absolutely hated it. Um, there was a, I think things have changed a lot, a lot of the hardcore fans were extremely unpleasant people. Um, and they got locked in a battle with John Nathan Turner. And it was all pretty, um, you know, we just ignored it, but it was there. And the irony was that the powers that be who hated Doctor Who loved Paradise Towers. They suddenly said, oh, this is a different way of doing it. And I think in a way they were both responding to the same thing which is no references to Gallifrey, no references to Time Lords, no Daleks, no Cybermen, nothing. A new world, which is always what's appealed to me about Doctor Who. I've never really been interested in the mythology of Doctor Who at all. I, I really find it quite boring. What I actually love is the idea of somebody who gets in the phone box and goes and has adventures. Uh, so both of my stories reflect that. And also it reflects what we would, Andrew Cartmore, my script editor and I, and the other writers were trying to do, which is try to sort of have a bit of a clear out because it, the Trials of a Time Lord, have you ever seen Trials of a Time Lord? It's some good writing in there, but basically it's all about references to previous Doctor Who's. And if you didn't know those, you wouldn't understand it. You know, you need a PhD in Who studies to, and it's the exact antithesis of what I like about who. Um, so I think that was, you know, why it got these very different, differing reactions. Um, yeah, and I think it's also why now the people who are drawn to it are drawn to it is because, you know, I, we, something maybe we can talk about later, you know, the comic books, short stories, things like that are happening. And I think it's because they both stories offer complete worlds. You don't need to put the Daleks in there or Time Lords or anything to make sense of the world. You can actually play with the worlds without, you don't even need the Doctor and the Companion there. Paradise Towers, you can just leave all those characters to get on with it. Um, I, like the, I, I like that sometimes, Stephen, as well, what you're saying. And it's something that's kind of like lacked a wee bit in the, the newer series of Doctor Who, you know, the, when it came back. Yes. Um, that you didn't get too many standalone stories, as I would call it, you know, yeah. where they just land somewhere, there's a problem, they solve it, and off they go. Yes. You know, exactly. it didn't, there's no, there doesn't even have to be any backstory about anything or, or any old enemies back there again that have been, yes. you know, I must admit, some of them have been very overused. You no, know, I, like the Daleks and Cybermen, they, they can give them a break, you know. Um, absolutely. And I think, look, there's so much more you could talk about. It's, what, it's supposed to be about a, a guy that can, uh, um, or a lady, that can travel anywhere, as they keep saying, anywhere in time and space. But it always seems to come back to the same kind of thing, you know. Yes. So where's the freedom in that? You yeah, know? I, I, I totally agree with you, you know. And, um, it looks as if Russell T. Davis is trying to do that again, you know, just not not bring back. It's almost like, how long are you going to go before you bring the Daleks back again? Is I think what every front runner seems to um, yeah. battle with. Well, they would say you, you got to have you can't have Doctor Who without at least having him see the Daleks, face the Daleks at least once, you know. Yeah. So I think inevitably, the current Doctor Shooty will face off oh, against them eventually. 
yeah, it's, yeah. It's inevitable, you know. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. But maybe in a little time off. Yeah, give it a bit of break. Give it a bit of space. Yeah, you know. No, absolutely. You know, because um, at the end of the last one, the last one, so it seemed to be they were flinging Daleks and Cybermen in like there was no. Yeah, all the, I know it was like, overkill. Horror. You thought, no, come on, come on, give us a break. I mean, there's so many original creatures and villains you could create. You know. Exactly. I mean, exactly. it's, it's it, the, the pool is endless, really, isn't it? So, I don't know why people they don't don't you know grab that opportunity more, really. No, you know? no, I, I think that's I think that's absolutely I I, I I I totally agree with you about that. I think that's why there have been such dis, differing views of my two stories over the years. You know, yeah. If you really want to know about all those things, you're not going to find them in my stories. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But what I did like um, about uh, about um, uh, uh, Paradise Towers was, again, the themes that you were touching upon, like this this dystopian kind of world in this high rise kind of uh, building on a planet. I assume yes. you know. I don't think the planet's actually referenced. Is it the name of the planet? Did you ever give uh, it a name? Or? Uh, no, it, I think the planet is called Paradise Towers. Oh, it's actually called that, right? I just I thought that was actual, so like actual building. I, 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 I always imagined it is a planet which is a high rise. There's nothing else there. Ah, oh, I see. I see. I think. I'm, 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 I'd have to go back to check, but I think that was the idea. You know, right. so so you are that. I don't know what it what it looked like externally, but that's what it is. A huge yeah. tower block. Floating that is the there. kind of that is the planet in a sense. Yeah, yeah. Yes. That's interesting. That yeah. Um, I like the things you were talking do, uh, doing about you know the, the, that they were stickler sticklers for um, reading out the rules in it you know yeah. subsections so zeros or whatever you know it was just it was very comical but yeah. also it was just like the mundanity of it you know yeah. that the, the, the they might, even they were becoming bored rigid with having to read all yeah, these absolutely. bloody rules out you know um, no, I mean it's interesting because one of the things. Um... Uh, I mean, when I was in Germany uh, quite recently talking about Paradise Towers, and, you know, they were questioning me in a way, you know, the chief caretaker has a little moustache and they all looked like Nazi stormtroopers. And I said, well, actually, that was never my intention. The whole point of the caretakers was, you know, they were the, the fat, the unfit, the people who couldn't go to... They were useless in the war and they, they couldn't catch the caretakers if they ran down the corridors because they were too unfit. And, you know, what that ends up with the casting, you get all these guys straight out of the gym, you know, looking like, you know, proper sort of super troopers. And, uh, and by the time you put that with to Richard putting his little Hitler moustache on, you're getting a slightly different feel from what I'd originally imagined. But, you know, that happens. <laughs> um, do you think that he, you know, when he became uh, possessed by Coragnon, mm. do you think he chewed the scenery a bit too much? Or, uh, uh, to be honest, I know, now, now he's gone, <laughs> which is a lovely man. I know. <laughs> many times. I, I think at some level he was quite defiant about it, but I thought it worried him a bit because he was an actor with absolutely perfect pitch normally, you know, absolutely spot on. I think part of the problem was that things went recorded in order. So the first recording he did was as Coragno. Uh, and I, my suspicion is that if he had been more settled into the real side, he would not have done it. I mean, people were trying to get him to turn it down. Um, I think it would have been, uh, it would probably have been slightly subtler, but you know, that's the nature of these ridiculous schedules you have, you know, three days in studio to get the whole bloody thing down. Um, and because that shot required him, I don't know, I can't remember the technical reason, but basically it was shot out of sequence and early. And I think that may have something to do with it. Yeah. That's why it kind of looked maybe jarred slightly, maybe on screen. I, I think so, yes. Mm. Yes. And I mean he, you know, I, I said I like Richard and I thought he was often very funny. It wasn't I, I wanted TP McKenna to play the part who played Captain Cook there. You I, got him later on for but for I another part, yeah. <laughs> something yeah. slightly quieter and more sinister. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But, I could see that. I could see that too. Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, so getting on to your second one, uh, uh, um, Stephen, The Greatest Show in the Galaxy. Um, my first question is, uh, do you like clowns? No. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm was it them. was it a sort of like a you kind of like facing um, your beers on the, out there kind of thing? Yes, it's not quite as bad as that. But yeah. what it was, because when I first started talking about clowns, everybody thought of the sort of Ronald McDonald, Coco the Clown sort of ones, who aren't technically the clowns, they're the Augusts. And I said, no, no, no. I remember going as a kid to the circus and there were these white-faced clowns in beautiful spangly costumes, ordering everything about. They never got dirty. They never did slaps it. They just told other people what to do. I said, that's the image I want. Um, that's what we're talking about. Um, and it is, I think somebody asked me this question and I, I, well, I, I realised that the thing about, I don't like about clowns is, you know, they're human beings, but their faces don't tell you what they're really like or what they're thinking. There is this sort of mask smeared on them and you, you can't, there's something to me slightly upsetting about that. Uh, yeah, so I don't know. Yeah, so it's, it's a bit of me. I mean, it's not. I, 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 I don't come screaming out of the room if I see a clown, but I don't really like clowns. It's interesting that that sort of irrational fear of things or phobias of things, isn't there? There's so many different yes, ones. Yeah. Uh, but clowns do come up quite an, an awful lot, and they're a real, real uh, subject for horror films. They clowns exactly. are used an awful lot in that. So they tap yes. into something that. Yes, and I think it's about about the dissociation of they're human, but they're not human. Um, You know, those masks they've painted on their faces. Yeah, there's something strange. What's going on behind that mask? Yeah. That's what, what are you reading into it? Yeah, I think that's what it is. Yeah. Um, So you use them quite, you know, to quite full effect here because uh, uh, um, Ace, uh, played by um, uh, um, Sophie Aldred, has a has a fear of them. Yes. Uh, um, and the doctor seems to be, I wouldn't say bullying her into to facing, you know, this problem, but he kind of gently ne- needles her, doesn't he? Yes, um, he does. Into yes. into going going to the planet, and uh, and, and she's quite she's she's not keen, but uh, eventually she does, you know, yes. go in. It's but, uh, a challenge, because it's a challenge, you know. Yeah. She she can't lose faith. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Um, so uh, um, the, again, you've got a really good cast here in this. You were quite l- lucky here, uh, I, I think, think, I think in, in, I, in, the, in the actors that are portraying your characters, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, the thing is, uh, uh, I like both scripts in a way equally, but there's no doubt The Greatest Show got overall a much better treatment. The casting is impeccable. The design is very good. The direction is very good. It's, um, you know, you you can't really fault it. There are a number of things in Paradise Towers when you think, no, they could have been better. I, you know, um, and it was done so quickly and it was like we were trying to turn the battleship in in a different direction in mid-sea. But with Greatest Show and Wearing, I I just went with it. And I think, you know, there's actually nothing in the, all the performances are good, all of every single one. You know, people always talk about Ian Reddington, understandably, but I mean, Christopher Garda's bellboy is extraordinary. You know, he really goes for it, you know, and his death scene is very chilling. Yes, it yeah. was. Um, he, he was very good. Um, and Harry, Harry displayed the kind of like the fear of the clowns as well, you know, that he was... I mean, he was quite scared of them, you know, when he was cowering in the corner and everything, you know. Yeah. Yes. Uh, um, but um, there were a couple of moments like, that were quite humorous, at least I thought they were. Um, uh, I, I'm sure, I'm assuming you pitched it like that, but maybe I can read into things sometimes that make me laugh, but maybe weren't intended to, if you know what I mean. But uh, um, there was one bit where I think it was just the way um, it was shot. It was on the, it was on the, uh, the hippie bus thing, you know, yes. the, Yes. That wonderful bus that yeah, it was brilliant. I love the artwork on it and everything. It was great. And um, you've got this robot bus conductor 
coming along, you know, waddling along. And he's cornering Sylvester. And uh, so it looks like he's going to kill him or something, you know. And uh, Sylvester rattles off this sort of like um, this diatribe of like, uh, I'd like a super saver multi whatever. I just found that hysterical. And then he blows the thing up at the end. You know? <laughs> I just love yeah, the way that was done. Yeah. I, I think that was one of the things, you know, I some people think humour um, undermines stories. To me, it sharpens them. You know, I think black humour is a very good mode for Doctor Who, and that's really what, by and large, I do. You know, it is funny, but also dark. <laughs> um, yeah, and it's because all the all the bus conductors' lines are hold tight and things like that. They're very, you know, if he strangles flower charm and stuff, it's, it's all a bit, you know... Uh, I mean, I can't remember where this idea came from. It's it's one of those logics. You go, oh, we've got a bus, a hippie bus. Let's have a bus conductor, and there, there you are. You know, you have a monster. It was a good. It was a good, It was quite well designed. Um, oh, absolutely. It was quite good. I thought, yeah. Ab oh, absolutely. Yeah. No, I no, I, I I really can't fault the design. And um, you know, in fact, they, as you know, there was this stuff about asbestos in the studio. Oh yes, because. Yeah, that's um, that caused them to, it to be on location, didn't it? Or, or um, yeah, BBC I Bar that, Park, I think it was, wasn't it? Where the right. um, circus tents were built. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's right. And David Lasky, the designer, and John Nathan Turner worked out that they could construct the circus on the car park in the Elstree uh, studios. Uh, and they did. And it had there was a huge problems because of external sound you know a studio would have been you know so there were lots of times when something went by a blah which made it different. on the other hand i think it was pure gain for the story because it feels like you're in a circus and those insubstantial corridors feel like insubstantial corridors and if the whole thing had been shot in the studio i don't think it would have been anything like as atmospheric there would have been something slightly dead about it um so that, and i think one of the reasons that they fought for it is because the location stuff had been so good and you know it's a fantastic cast and i think it was a general thing you can't chat this away um, yeah i um i think it worked well actually it, it kind of benefited it really didn't it that particular story i, having, I think ha having it shot outside i think it did yeah I, I think so. I think it's yeah. something tangible, but you know, it's actually there. You you, you sort of know that it's freestanding and it's not um, stuck inside the studio. Yeah. Um, uh, I, I I also liked um, the the, uh, the 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 premise of um, the family of free. You know, the family that were inside the uh, the the uh, uh, tent watching these performances over and over again you know and never being impressed or anything yeah. at, at first we don't really we we just think they're a bit odd we don't realize who they are later on you know uh, um but it, it it it's the it's the idea of it of um entertainment being this insatiable first for entertainment yes never never been sated enough and but the consequence of it um if if it bores you or whatever, you can get rid of the yeah, entertainer yeah. and yeah. kill them. So it's it's like you know that's then that's the dark bit you know that comes in. Right. You know it starts sort of teetering on the edge. You know, absolutely. You no, know, I think it's because um, uh, I mean a lot of people, and it's likely they like, sometimes get a bit bored with this. Think the whole story has to be an allegory about Doctor Who. You know which. And obviously, the Wiz, the Wiz Kid is a parody of a Doctor Who fan added later to the mix. But to me, I, it's about something more interesting than that, which is about what in fact happened is that the sort of freewheeling hippie culture of the 60s and early 70s was sucked up and drained dry by the commercial forces that ran entertainment. And, you know, and then in many cases, just spat them out again. Um, so that, to me, is really what the overall 
writing story is is about. Um, and it's a bit boring to me to say it's about Doctor Who. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I, I'm a, I haven't said much publicly about this, but there's a study of um, uh, Best Show in the Galaxy came out quite recently, and it's all about the show being an uh, analogy for Doctor Who, you know. And so the family are the BBC high ups, and oh, the oh yes, the um, the sales lady played by Peggy Mount is BBC Enterprises. Oh, it's just ridiculous, absolutely ridiculous. And again, I think what it is, it's a bit what I'm saying with Paradise Towers. Um, uh, People always want to believe it comes from a previous Doctor Who story or something I've read, but actually a lot of it's coming out of what I'd experienced and what I'd seen in terms of what had happened to that free reading culture. Um, so that to me was the underlying theme. I I would be really interested to know in the current climate of multimedia that we have now yeah. compared to when you wrote that, you yes. know, those stories previously how you would write it now you know well yes i i don't i don't know i mean it was it, it's odd that in the first conversations between tenant and shooty um the gogs of ragnarok were actually name checked now my agent and i have heard nothing so i don't think anything is going to happen very soon but they both of but it was odd that they just chose those names uh, out of nowhere because it would be, maybe they like the sound of them, but, you know, out of all the names they could have chosen, to have chosen that is quite odd. Um, it's interesting because it's kind of like um, the way Russell writes is that he pictures these little, he drops these little things in, these little name checks or something mysterious in the narrative that may play out later on and, and be part of an arc. You know, a yeah. season mark that pays off at the end. He's done this before, um, and there's a couple. Of, there was a couple of moments in the last specials where they 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 name drop a like this these ominous names like um, the one who waits yeah. or the boss or yeah. my minions are coming, and it's sort of setting up something that's going to happen later on. Yeah. So you, you never know, yeah. uh, uh, Stephen. You might get a little little phone call saying, "God's a Ragnarok." Uh, yeah. Yes. <laughs> I mean, it, it'll just be, you know, uh, they do have to clear it with me. So, I mean, I know nothing's happening. I can tell you definitively nothing is happening in the next season or so. But, you know, he, he does have that thing, putting the, make little notes in his brain and he carries ideas around. So it must be about something. Uh, but also it must have been, going back to your original thing about, I mean, I will never be asked to write for this modern one, but... It must be something that he can see working in a modern context. You know, that idea of insatiable gods of entertainment. <laughs> we shall see. Yeah, it's a nice thought, though. It is a nice thought at, the, at this point. Yeah, why, why those particular names he, he name-checked, you know? Uh, uh, yeah, it's, it's, that's interesting. And, yeah. I hadn't given it much, and I hadn't given it much thought until you kind of said it now. You know, I just... I just thought, oh, it was just a nice little uh, affectionate nod to the fans, you know, name these. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I don't didn't think if there was anything more going on, maybe. You know? I, I, uh, I, I carry no <laughs> inside the knowledge whatsoever. <laughs> I wouldn't press a press on you, even if you did. Don't worry, no, Steve. I, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> um, now you you uh, you you must have enjoyed these characters you wrote for for, mm. for the two TV stories because you've gone back to them quite a number of times. You've written short stories about characters from Paradise Towers, and I believe Greatest Show in the Galaxy too. What what brings you what brings you back uh, to? Well, to... It's, it's, it's not because it's all it, very much in the last few years. There was a huge gap of about thirty years when I had nothing to do with Doctor Who, what, and people don't quite believe me now. But after Doctor Who, classic Doctor Who stopped for the next whatever it was, eleven. I can't remember years. Doctor Who was not a good credit to have. If you were pitching for a job in TV, you did not say brightly, oh, I wrote for Doctor Who because it was regarded as naff. Um, and 
it was very gradually it started coming back and being appreciated. Um, and the actual starting point for writing more stuff, well, I had approaches from Gareth Kavanagh at Cutaway Comics. Um, but also the, the first thing, and the first thing that happened was actually that um, I went to Gallifrey One in Los Angeles with and some chums were there, including Jessica Martin. And Jessica, Jessica at that point had done three mag stories for uh, Big Finish. Um, I'd had nothing to do with them except licensing the character. And anyway, so she introduced me to all the, the, the Big Finish people who were there and sort of said brightly, well, why doesn't Stephen write a, a story for you about the creation of the Psychic Circus? So they couldn't think of a good reason why not, and I couldn't. So that's how it came about. Um, and so there have been quite a few quite a few different spin-offs since that point. Uh, and I have started writing other stuff about about my characters. Um, I say, as you say, short stories. The comics are created by um, Sean Mason, not by me, but they're inspired by, and there is a new uh, musical, audio musical, Children of the Circus, uh, written by Kenton, which is, um, again, inspired by, not created by me. Uh, but then I have written some stories and short pieces, which, in fact, we've just we, uh, cut away, commissioned three short uh, scripts from me, and it's taken quite a lot of time for them to be um, uh, recorded and put out there, but they have just been recorded, and we one of them is about the great architect Caragnon, who is played on the uh, CD by Ian Reddington, which is an interesting piece of casting. Um, so yes, yeah, so there is there is a lot more interest than, than there was, and, and more interest from me in a way. No, uh, and also um, I wrote um, a piece called Me and Him and Who, which is uh, an audio play about John Nathan Turner and his partner Gary in the, in the years after, the, after Doctor Who. So it's a sort of tragic comedy really about two-hander, uh, which I think worked quite well, and there may be a theatre version coming up as well, hopefully this year, you never know. Um, but so that was interesting to write as well. Yeah, um, oh, well, I can imagine that would be, yeah. Because I knew them quite well, I knew them quite well. Um, yeah, yeah. And it was a, it's a sad story really, um, what happened. Um, I'm John had his faults, but he was a very, you know, imaginative kind man and he just never really got it together after after he left who yeah he was typecast yes he Absolutely. was he was Absolutely. he wanted to leave he wanted to leave earlier than he than was available to him but that there, there was no one else that wanted to take it on at that time uh, and no, he just no. got stuck with it and it you know he did his best with what he had i suppose yeah and he i mean he he you know the last three we were very lucky and I think I mean he took a complete chance on Andrew Cartman was the script editor. Andrew had no background whatsoever. I mean loved science fiction. And uh, you know, he got us all together as writers and you know I, it had not everything is great, but it's an incredibly imaginative set of stories, you know, trying out all sorts of approaches and stuff like that. And the basic credit for that goes back to Andrew, um, and he he created a group of writers as well, which is un, you know unusual in that we knew each other, um, and uh, yeah, so that that was absolutely. And John was very good as an enabler. He just, he let us get on with it basically. Um, scripts were never his strong point, uh, but he was. He was great at getting things done and like saving Greatest Show in the Galaxy. A lot of people would just say to the BBC, okay, let's take the insurance and 
Yeah. That's that. Which, found, which a way around, found a way of getting around that problem. You yeah, know? just scrapped it and take the yeah. money. Um, and he was also a great promoter for the show. Absolutely. I mean, Absolutely. whatever you can say about him, one of his big qualities was promotion. I mean, he Absolutely. He, he really he did. Yeah. And, that's, and, and that's what brought it to... It, it was it with it was with his help. I think without him, it wouldn't have been so popular in America, because he kind of started he started the ball rolling in the promotion over in America, with all the conventions and stuff, you know, things like that, um, and brought it to a new audience, you know. No, absolutely. And I mean, he was ahead of his time in that way because that wasn't the BBC way at that point. You know, part of the problem was that you know the hierarchy was very Oxbridge. We do the classics, we do John Le Carre, and you've got this guy who wears um the flashy shirts, came up through the ranks as a as a production manager, and they they did not get on. Yeah. Uh, I mean now, I mean the BBC will fling anything to get the bloody thing promoted, really. I mean, <laughs> I mean no, it's, <laughs> It's you know it's gone beyond anything John could have imagined in terms of marketing. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, there's more money. There's more money at it there now as well. Because well, uh, it's a money maker. Yeah. And I mean, it could have been more of a money maker at the time. Uh, yeah. I just didn't get behind it. I mean, it's mo I mean, John did it on minuscule budgets. Yeah. Um, it's interesting. The main financial contribution contributor within the BBC was not the drama department, it was BBC Enterprises who handled the exterior stuff. And they were getting good sales from Doctor Who, so they needed more product, so they put money in. The drama department would have had to let it die. Well, they did let it die in the end. But there we are, it had a happy ending. <laughs> yeah, eventually, yeah, it did, that's right. But for a while there, it was, you know, Oh, it, was, they really uh, didn't want to know it. They were trying to bury it, weren't they? Let's, they were definitely trying. You know. you know, when they put it out against Coronation Street on Monday night, I mean... Yeah. I mean, that's just ridiculous. It was. <laughs> you can't... No, absolutely. It was always, it had always gone out on Saturday. At, at yeah. it, it, it was like a deliberate idea to prove that it really didn't work, you know? Yeah. Uh, you know, but I think, you know, good work was done. And, and you know, a lot of it, a lot of, a lot of Andrew Cartmell's work um, stands, the, stands, time, stands up to time. It's only a pity that actually, he, because he was so involved in that, he never got to write a story himself, which most script editors have done in the past. I wonder, had it, had it gone on another year or two, whether he may have done, you know? I think he would, I think he would have. I think he wished, wanted to do that. It was just yeah. unfortunate. Yeah, it didn't happen. So did. yeah. Um wanted to get on to just to talk about that audio because we, we we didn't really go into it, but the one I haven't heard it, by the way, uh, Stephen. Not at the moment anyway. Um uh, was uh, um the psychic circus that you wrote for Big yeah. Finish. So and you brought a few characters back from the original story. There's a few actors from it. But the interesting thing is that it, it acts as a prequel, doesn't it? Yes, correct. We've got a bit of time, time, time sort of paradoxes going on. Can you kind of explain a little bit as to what we're what we're dealing with it within that story? Uh, how how is uh, Sylvester's doctor going there? Does he have foreknowledge of the events later on? But the other characters do not. Know him? Am I right in saying that? <laughs> I think it's an awful lot of this tiny <laughs> yeah. that I don't really understand. I had a very good script editor, and um, I mean, to me, the interesting thing was actually it was a story about how um, how it all started. You know, so you got the, you know there were these group of disparate hippies performers, circus performers, and how they all got together, and how the how they were taken over, how the dream curdled, because when we see it in Ready Show, it's already happened. The circus is totally compromised. So that to me was the interesting part. Um, I had to use the master, which uh, everybody says, isn't it great using the master? It, it's what I was talking about. I don't, it was fine. I got lots of help with it, but it wasn't terribly interesting to me. You know, uh, 
So it was it was fine. It went well. I'm I'm pleased I did it, but I don't think either Big Finish or I really thought that the, we were going to work together a lot afterwards. <laughs> oh right. <laughs> You know, um, I think it's fine. You know, it's a production because I think so much of Big Finish's work is about um, what happened if the fourth doctor remember the seventeenth companion and they fought the Daleks. You know, these sort of yeah, you know, yeah, uh, and it's so much not what I do. Yeah, I, I, um, I think you 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 kind of you you you, make, you kind of touched upon that earlier on, didn't you? Yeah. Saying yeah. you didn't like the baggage of uh, the, the doctor's character. He wanted just just to do fresh stories. Yes, absolutely. Without having to reference anything that came before. Yeah. And I kept on saying, so what's this thing about Mars? As far as I can see, every story the Master says, aha, Doctor Who, I've defeated you now, and he hasn't. That seems to be the story of the Master, you know. And I've some people have done that. Uh, Sasha Thoran did wonderful things with the Master. I thought he was fantastic. But I hadn't seen that when I did work for the Master. Uh, so... But it was a night. It was a you know. It was good. It was good to have done. Uh, yeah. Um, so fi- lastly, uh, uh, um, Stephen, um, what are you doing at the moment? Uh, what, what are you still? What are you? What, are you, what sort of things are, are, are bubbling? Well, um, I've just completed uh, uh, a radio four commission for an hour-long radio play, which we're recording in February. Nothing to do with science fiction at all. Um, <laughs> um, I've written a one-woman show for Jessica Martin, uh, and we're hoping to do some tryouts of that. Uh, so that's another thing on the... Uh, and in a way, the most exciting thing for me, which again has nothing to do with Doctor Who, is I wrote this historical novel called The World and His Wife, and um, AUK have done an audio version of it, which is going to be combined with the first issue of it as an ebook. So that's coming out either later this month or next month. And that's very exciting for me because it was a, a, a project that means a lot to me. And in the battle for everybody's attention, you know, didn't, <laughs> didn't manage to get too much above the surface you know so 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 there were lots of these lots of things of this sort uh going on we just have to wait and wait and see which is usually the way things are you never know what's going to happen when do you know do you know at this point who's going to be reading that audio book for you oh it's already been it's already uh, yeah it it, it's um uh, five mantle Oh yes, yeah, Clive Mantle, uh, yeah. His wife had Carlin and Donsa. Um, it's still slightly under wraps. I'm sure by if you put this out, that's fine. They get AUK get a little sticky if I say too much ahead because it's yeah, yeah. You know, but, but no, lovely cast. They've done a great job. You know, great. Uh, so yeah, so that's that's good. That's that's fantastic stuff. Yeah, good to see you doing. St- Keeping your your hand in there, yeah. writing. You know? Well, I you know the box that says retired. I always hesitate over. Yeah. <laughs> Whether I am or I'm not, uh, you know, I'm not working or earning it. Really. What I did at my peak, but I'm still working. You know. Yeah. So that's that's it. Well, I it, it's been a pleasure speaking to you, Stephen. I thank yeah, you so much pleasure. for joining me. No, thanks very much. It's been a very enjoyable interview, and uh, good luck with your future interviews as well. Thank you. I appreciate that. And um, uh, so, guys, thank you also for watching this. And I hope you'll join us very soon for another interview. And we, we, it won't be long before we're back, I'm sure. So until then, thank you um, and take care. Bye bye. <laughs>